Hey, everybody out there. Once again, with us is Joe Pedraza, attorney Joe Pedraza, the longtime lawyer for the Greenberg family, who is still fighting to get the finding of suicide overturned to at least undetermined or homicide, which they are convinced it was. And Joe, there are several uh, court cases going on now to achieve the goal of getting finally to the truth and finally a competent, real investigation. So tell us about those two court cases, where they stand, what's going on, Joe. We'll do so, Larry. But first, let me say thank you very much for the opportunity to chat with you. Um, there are two lawsuits, um, one which is specifically seeking to change the manner of death on Ellen's death certificate from suicide to something else. That case has been going on since 2019. We went through the trial court. We've gone through a what we call an intermediate appellate court or a court that reviews what happened at the trial court level. And today we are now in front of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And that's about and, standing, Joe, isn't it? Whether the parents of Ellen Greenberg have standing to get the medical examiner's uh, finding of a suicide overturned, whether they themselves have a right or standing to bring this case in court, correct? Uh, that's correct. That's the issue, Larry. Um, one would think to themselves, like, well, if parents can't speak for their deceased child and protect their deceased child, well, who can? Which is essentially our position. Uh, so we feel pretty strong that the Supreme Court, by taking this case, may be saying, hey, we think that parents, executors, administrators, they should be able to speak for deceased people uh, and be able to bring cases like the one that we brought on Ellen's behalf. Okay, the other case going on uh, separately is a conspiracy to cover up a murder, correct? Th yeah, that's correct. Um, and Larry, this is one where um, we take except we take all of our litigation seriously, but the nature of this charge against public officials as accessories after the fact of hiding a homicide, which is a crime by itself, which a DA or the attorney general's office or even the U.S. attorney's office could prosecute as a crime is what we have alleged in the second uh, lawsuit, which is presently pending in Philadelphia. And if we receive a favorable ruling, would go to trial in um, uh, early February of next year. Who is part of this alleged conspiracy? Well, Larry, there are, as defendants, three, mem three former members of the medical examiner's office in Philadelphia, Drs. Galino, Drs. Osborne, and Dr. Emery. Uh, in addition, we have two police officers, one present and one former. The former is uh, Sergeant Cooney. The present is Detective uh, McNamee. Um, they are the defendants in the case um, that we have sued. And uh, we have alleged that they have, in, at various times, participated in hiding the very evidence or making up evidence that's false in order to support a suicide manner of death for Ellen when all along they've known, in fact, it's something other than suicide. More specifically, how did they go about this covering up a murder? Well, there were two things, Larry. Uh, back in uh, January of 2011, when uh, Ellen died, uh, two things needed to be falsified in order to change the original determination by Dr. Osborne which was homicide to suicide. First of it was Dr. Osborne wanted to know that uh, the fiance, Sam, was witness breaking through the door before he called 911. And therefore, uh, according to Drs. Galino and Osborne, they were told by the police that in fact, Sam had been witness breaking through the door and then finding Ellen and calling 911. And the person who had uh, witnessed him was a security person, um, Phil Hanton, uh, up at the, the apartment complex. That is a false representation made out of whole cloth, meaning there has never been any support for that claim being made 
by either the police, the medical examiner's office, or anybody else. The police file that we got in this litigation specifically says that Sam was not witness breaking through that door before calling 911. So they've known that all along from January 2011 to you and I being here today. Um, in addition, Sam was interviewed twice and he never contended that anybody was with him when he broke through the door before calling 911. You know, one would think that that information would be the first thing he would say as, as an alibi. So you're saying that, that the fiancé, uh, Sam uh, Goldberg, never said himself that he had a witness? Not in any of the statements that were produced by the police. And Sam was interviewed on two separate occasions. And he never contended he had a witness when he broke through the door. So therefore, your conclusion is that these officials that you say conspired made it up. Well, they have had to because the police file specifically does indicate that they know that Sam was not witness when he broke through the door. So where did that information come from? According to Galeno and Osborne, it came from the police. But yet nobody can identify who said that. What is the significance of whether he broke through the door or not? Well, according to Osborne, Osborne said, look, when I looked at her medically, it's a homicide. All the bruises, all the stab wounds, it's a homicide. No question in his mind. So he had heard that, you know, it was a let or it was uh, it was said to him that the fiance broke through the door and he found Ellen in that state. Well, Osborne initially said, well, look, you know, I have to have a suspicion because who is, who is the first person you would think if there's a homicide? Usually it's a loved one or somebody close to the victim. So he said, I had to think, well, sure, the fiance is saying that, but, you know, I have to have a healthy skepticism about it. When he was told, meaning when Osborne was told, you can put that skepticism aside because he has a witness. When he went through that door, well, Osborne claimed, well, that really helped me then think, well, maybe she was alone when all of these stab wounds occurred. And if she was alone, that seems to support suicide. Yeah. So it was very important to Osborne, this lie being given to him about the well, Sam being witness going through the door. Yeah, Osborne was the original medical examiner. Originally, for, for those who haven't followed this case closely, you have to reinstate this. This is, this is crucial. Uh, the medical examiner originally said that it was a homicide. Then, after being talked to by various officials, he was persuaded to change it to suicide, which in itself is extraordinary, is it not? Absolutely. Uh, we are unaware of any other instance in the history of Pennsylvania of circumstances like this having occurred, that somebody said, hey, this is a homicide, and then 180 degrees later says, no, it's really a suicide, which, by the way, is not a crime. So it was very unique. But to um, and, and also, Joe, if I could interrupt you, but by labeling it a suicide, since it's not a crime, that shuts down any investigation also, right? That is correct. Yeah. The file then is stored away and collects dust from that point going forward to the end of time. Uh, who uh, are you accusing of conspiring to cover up a murder? Well, it started out with, according to um, our pleading and what we allege, it starts out with uh, Drs. Galino and, doctors, uh, and Dr. Osborne and the police officers, uh, McNamee and Cooney. Cooney was a supervisor of the detectives who were investigating the matter. Uh, McNamee was a um, partner to another detective who was investigating the matter. What we found out in our discovery is there were uh, two meetings, one on uh, January 28th, excuse me, one on January 27th, which would be the next day after Ellen, let me stand corrected, January 28th, we'll get the timeline right. That's two days after Ellen's death. The um, detectives uh, McNamee and uh, another detective, Sierra, 
meet with Dr. Osborne. From that point forward, and at this point, Dr. Osborne has said this is a homicide. So the reason the detectives were meeting is because they're told, hey, there's a homicide here. Now you got to put the facts together, find out who did it for the prosecution. From that point forward, the press releases from the police department challenged this claim that it was a homicide and were consistently being released to the media that they thought it was something else. So there's a first meeting. On February 1st, there is a second meeting. At this second meeting now, Dr. Galino attends, Dr. Osborne attends, uh, Detective McNamee's there, Detective Sierra's there, and now their supervisor, Lieutenant Bell, is present. It is at that meeting that Dr. Galino and Dr. Osborne said the non-medical evidence that they got or facts all came from the police, that they were told that the fiance was witness going through the door. And therefore, you could trust what the fiance was saying about how he found Ellen. Now, that gets you only 50% of the way there. Because medically, anybody who looks at this case, all the stab wounds, all 20 of them, 10 in front, 10 in back, five extremely serious ones, each of which by the, by itself would incapacitate Ellen and the bruises all over her body and, and other features. Everybody would say medically, this is a homicide. So now you have to deal with the medical evidence. How do you handle that? Because Dr. Osborne already went on record saying it's a homicide. So at that meeting on February 1st, according to the detective notes, it was Dr. Galino who said, hey, well, maybe she could have lost feeling and continued to stab herself as a result of that. And why don't you bring in an internationally renowned neuropathologist by the name of Lucy Rourke Adams, who happened to be on contract with the medical examiner's office for neurological forensic work. And everybody goes, oh, that's a great idea. Although... When I deposed Dr. Galino, he denied that he ever made such a recommendation at that time because he said, I, I didn't know enough about the case to, to say that she would have lost feeling, et cetera. But let's put that aside. So the next day, the police notes indicate that Dr. Osborne calls Detective Sierra and says, hey, I did speak with Dr. Lucy or Rourke Adam, and guess what? She took a quick look at this and she said, well, um, yeah, she, Ellen could have continued to stab herself and yeah, she would have lost feeling. So that's why she could still, you know, stab herself 20 times. And then Dr. Osborne said, well, since medically she could do it and I'm being told that the fiance was follow or was watched when he went into the room, well, she had to be alone and the door was locked. So she had to have killed herself. So I'm changing it to a suicide as of February 2nd. What do we find out later, Larry? Dr. Lucy Rourke had no role at all in the assessment of Ellen's case. None. She gave no opinion. She, she said, offered. She said she has no recollection, no record of it, no billing, nothing that would indicate that she actually performed what was what a curbside exam correct yeah and, and it, to make it even more an assistant district attorney in 2015 2016 who who took another look at this case actually spoke with dr lucy rourke adam back then and dr uh, lucy rourke adam said i had no role in this i didn't do it i, I didn't participate so what do we have here, Larry? From our vantage point, we have two lies that were used in order to change a homicide to a suicide. Who, who, who was that other district attorney assistant that uh, confirmed this? His name was Guy D'Andrea. Guy D'Andrea, yeah. And this is not just some prosecutor. Guy D'Andrea at that time was prosecuting homicides, meaning... You're the top, basically the top most experienced talent in the district attorney's office in Philadelphia for these very difficult cases. And Guy was asked to take a look at the case and asked if he could. 
just on his own time. And for essentially a year, year and a half period, Guy went through the file thoroughly, had multiple discussions with Dr. Galino, raised with Dr. Galino the very problems we're talking about here today, that, oh, there is no absolute proof that the fiancé broke through that door. There's no absolute proof that the fiancé was witness. In fact, all indications are he wasn't witness going through the door. There's no absolute proof that uh, Lucy Rourke was consulted and gave this opinion that said that Ellen could self-administer these 20 wounds and wouldn't have felt any pain. And when you take all that away, how can you say this is a suicide without more investigation? Well, at least one or two of the wounds was determined to be posthumous or, or post-mortem after she died. Well, that comes in later, but you're absolutely right about it. We, we call that the 1.1 centimeter wound. And if people reach to the back of their necks in the cervical area, which is, you know, essentially top near your skull, uh, if you can imagine taking a knife that's about eight to 10 inches long, apparently, according to the authorities, Ellen put a knife that far back and punctured up into her spine. So she cuts through the spinal column, which everybody's kind of familiar with from skeletons, through there. And inside that spinal column is what we call a dura. So it's a layer of skin. She punctures the column. She punctures the dura. But apparently the authorities say she stops from cutting her spinal cord. So you got the cord. It's a, there's a dura skin wrapped around it. And then wrapped around all of that is the spinal column. So there's two wounds associated with this 1.1, the wound into the spinal column and the wound into the skin inside of the spinal column. Both of those wounds lack hemorrhage. Hemorrhage, well, if you right now were to take a piece of paper and cut your finger, what would happen? Yeah, you have blood. In yeah. medical terms, they call that hemorrhage. Right. You bleed. If you are alive, your heart is pumping blood all the way through your body and, you know, all over all the tissues. So every tissue, when you're alive, that gets punctured, it bleeds. It hemorrhages. When you're dead, well, what happens? Well, the old heart no longer is pumping the blood through the body. You know, the blood no longer is going up or wherever. And as a result of that, the tissues lose the blood. They don't hemorrhage when they get pierced. The dura and the spinal column here have no hemorrhage, which the medical examiner's office person who looked at it in 2019 specifically said at her deposition that to her meant that Ellen was dead when that wound was administered. Well, what else do we know, Larry? The knife wasn't found in the back of her neck with that wound, the knife was in her chest. So to accept the authority story and accept what this pathologist of the city, medical examiner's office said, Ellen would have had to have been dead when she stabbed herself into the spinal column and the dura, pulled that knife out while she's dead and swung it around hard enough that she pierced it through her chest and through ribs and everything else to cut her heart. You know, Impossible. Yeah, I know. Mean, Joe, putting all this together, I mean, it's beyond the point of absurdity. So what you're alleging, in other words, is that the fix was in, and it was the fix was put in fairly quickly in this case. That's correct. That That's the allegation. And then as time went on, as it be, is it was being revealed and sunshine was being shown on this fraud that the authorities doubled down, that they were not going to admit that the determination was based on false information. So they continued to just hide it and, and continue this false statement that Ellen committed suicide. You know, Joe, uh, some, somebody who, whose role, I think, is not mentioned enough in this is the current governor of Pennsylvania, who at the time was the attorney general of the state 
And at the time, he reviewed this case twice with all this evidence you've laid out. And twice he determined it was a clear cut suicide. How could that be explained? This crime fighting attorney general that we had put all the crooks in jail, investigate this, investigate that. Yet in the Ellen Greenberg case, twice the parents went to him to get him to investigate it, reopen the case. Twice he said suicide. How can that be explained? Well, uh, we cannot accept that there's any explanation that supports suicide. Um, as to the individual, the, the attorney general himself did not personally review this case, but his underlings, it's a big office. So apparently people claim to have looked at the case. We really don't know what, if any, effort was done. There was exceptionally limited communications between the attorney general's office, my office, and even my clients and experts who you know, have weighed in on this case. What, if anything, they did, we really don't know. Um, all I can say to you, Larry, is anybody who has looked at all of the evidence in this case has concluded that this cannot be ruled a suicide and more investigations required. And quite a few have gone as far as to say, look, it's a homicide. Larry, I'll say this to you. The city of Philadelphia, when they filed a brief in one of the appeals, the appeal that's in front of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, at the level just below the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, they specifically say in their brief that the evidence in this case of Ellen Greenberg could support other determinations besides suicide. Now, just stop there. Before you can say something's a suicide, you got to rule out the equally plausible explanations like accident, like um, homicide. You don't just simply say, well, there's four equally plausible explanations here. And, oh, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to throw the dart. Oh, it landed on suicide. So let's call it a suicide. No, your job is to then say, here's your differential diagnosis. These are the possibilities. Which of them is more believable, more supportable than the others, and why? Now the that uh, never done that. now that the former attorney general, who declared it a suicide twice as the governor of the state, as governor, does he have any kind of power or leverage or persuasion to get this case reopened? I, I think at this point, Larry, um, with the case being in the judiciary in the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia, uh, I think most folks are satisfied that let's see how the judicial system proceeds with the case. But but short of that, uh, if none of that works out, does he have the power as a governor to do anything about this? Um, uh, besides possibly making a recommendation or contacting the Attorney General and suggesting that this should be done, I'm not sure it falls within the jurisdiction of a governor at this and, and by the way, it should also be noted that those uh, who were in his office at the time that investigated the case, reviewed the case when it was brought to him twice by the parents of Ellen Greenberg, uh, most of those people that supposedly reviewed the case, weren't that, that, wasn't that the same crew that was in the district attorney's office <laughs> that originally went along with the finding of suicide? Well, that's that's what's been suggested to us, which does raise, certainly in my mind, uh, how thorough an investigation was it in the AG's office and how objective was it? I mean, how objectively does somebody assess their own involvement in, in something? I, I don't know. Uh, again, I wasn't inside the Attorney General's office and they did not consult with us besides a few uh, conversations of a non-substantive nature. So all I know is the evidence that we have right now, we are confident that 12 jurors anywhere in this state will conclude that Ellen was murdered. And what has been done here by public officials is reprehensible. This is not how public officials should serve the people, as far as I'm concerned. Joe, I know you're a busy guy, but we're wrapping up now. Uh, was there any new use and useful information obtained by these depositions that you've done? 
Well, there was. I uh, it, it helped fill in, like when meetings occurred, uh, what information was allegedly conveyed. Um, we could put it in a timeline and have a better understanding. Um, we could also see that, for instance, the neuropathologist of the medical examiner's office in 20, uh, 2021, when she was deposed initially, and said that that 1.1 centimeter wound, the one we are talking about, the cervical spine and the dura, um, that she, you know, as far as she was concerned, that was administered when Ellen was dead. We saw that there was backtracking from that by her. And, you know, now that she's a defendant who's been sued in this case, um, she's now taken a 180 degree change and says, well, I, I really didn't mean that. I It could be a lot of reasons why there isn't the hemorrhage. So and, and that it, and that was who again? That's Dr. Emery. Emery. So I, I, you know, what we've seen here, um, certainly from the parents vantage point is institutional desire to reaffirm what it did and frankly a refusal to listen to the greenbergs um, or even address they have never said to us the evidence that you've presented is wrong because a b c d no the city just sits there and says wow yeah um certainly could ex that evidence can certainly support something other than suicide but guess what greenbergs it's our decision and you can't do a damn thing about it and we're not going to do anything about it that's been the attitude from the city is that you can't make us and we're not going to regardless of what you tell us that's the attitude so realistically speaking what are your after 13 years trying to pursue what actually happened in the Ellen Greenberg case, and you've been on the case the lawyer for a number of years. After all this time, are the chances increasing that you will prevail, or is it still largely undetermined? Well, let me say this to you, Larry. The fact that we're having this podcast, I think we already prevailed. I don't know anybody in the general population, whether they are citizens of Pennsylvania, citizens of the Northeast region, citizens of the United States of America, or internationally, who believes that Ellen was anything but murder. So as far as I'm concerned, if we ultimately get the authorities to change the suicide so that an investigation happens, that's terrific. But I feel personally in my heart that we've already fulfilled the goal that Sandy and Josh Greenberg wanted when we started. And that was that people understand that their daughter was murdered. There's something wrong with our government when a citizen has to fight like this to get recognition of something so obvious. And I think we've accomplished that. And as I said to you while off record here today, kudos to yourself and kudos to other members of the media who have kept this story in the forefront and front and center so that people are aware of what's happening here, because God forbid, someday your family may be subjected to this. Exactly. And how many families have been subjected to this? Exactly. And that's something that people should really think long and hard about, because this case is not just about Ellen Greenberg and changing the death certificate. It's, it's about how government has treated a member of the population. And it's got to stop. Well, Joe Pedraza, you know, we're hoping all of us that truth will prevail. And uh, kudos to you for giving this such an effort. You know, you've been putting a lot of time and effort into this and uh, not giving up. So uh, we'll be talking more. And uh, thanks once again, Joe Pedraza, a longtime attorney for the Greenberg family. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Larry, and God bless. Thank you.